right, so we have a really fun presentation now. This is a virtual tour. Um, across the street is the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory. Did I remember that right? The NSCL, it's behind you. Ooh. And the FRIB, you don't say FRIB, it is FRIB. It is less fun, but that's how you say it. It's a facility for rare isotope beams. Um, Really cool facilities right across the street, a new one being built, so you're gonna hear all about it. Um, but we have a virtual tour of it, and uh, it's something we're really proud of. We've had several students work on it to help build it, and so I'm gonna turn it over to the people who made it happen. Professor Jadeep Singh, who's gonna introduce how it, how it happened. Catherine Hermanson, who is a student who's working on the project. Hey, everybody. I know it's the last day. All right, and Zach, Dr. Zach Constan, who is the outreach coordinator for the NSCL and FRIB, who is a very wonderful and energetic presenter, and he's wonderful. So, all right, they're all wonderful. I love you guys. All right, so I'm gonna pass it over to Professor Singh. All right. Oh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, you should make us earn it. Um, so. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jade Ape. Uh, I'm a professor in the physics department as well as the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory. Uh, and uh, the genesis of this project uh, actually was in this building. I was sitting right there when Shannon showed us uh, the Digitar, the di di Digitar, Digistar, thank you, <laughs> Digistar system uh, and the capabilities that it had on projecting really uh, beautiful images on the full dome. Uh, and uh, right when I saw it, I thought this would be really fantastic for the work that we did. Uh, and and uh, the motivation is sort of twofold. We wanted to create a virtual tour of the lab. Uh, and we wanted to also, in doing the virtual tour of the lab, tell the story of the research that occurs at the Cyclotron Lab and that will occur in the future at EFRIT. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to do this is because uh, whenever I tell people in the Lansing area, in the East Lansing area that I work at the lab, they get very excited. They have all sorts of questions about what we do there. Um, and, and, and we don't do any defense work or anything like that. We do pure science. Uh, and there's a real hunger and curiosity for the work that we do there. Uh, and we don't uh, always have an opportunity to give an open house. So we do that about once every two, couple three years. years, every couple of years. Uh, when we open up the entire facility so people can walk through and have a look. Uh, but it's a very large undertaking. Uh, and even when we do open things up, it's hard to see all the equipment. Uh, it's hard to get a tour. It's not very accessible. There's lots of stairs. Uh, it takes many people to do this. Uh, and so we wanted to create a virtual tour that we can uh, recreate that. And actually, you can see more of the lab in this tour than you can on actually a walking tour of the lab. Uh, and we can accommodate more people uh, uh, in, the uh, in this room to see the tour. Uh, and it's accessible to everyone because it's easy to get into this building. Uh, and we can do it with uh, just one person leading the tour. So today that'll be Zach. Um, the, uh, the funding for this project uh, actually comes from my uh, NSF grant. Uh, and one of the reasons my NSF grant was chosen for funding is because the reviewers were so impressed with the outreach component of my grant. Uh, and so it highlights a really nice uh, opportunity and collaboration that I was able to, uh, that we were able to put together with Shannon. Uh, what you'll see on the tour are real 3D models of the equipment that we use, as well as um, 3D images of the uh, space. And one really exciting thing that I enjoy about this project is that we bring in students who uh, come from uh, non-scientific backgrounds to work on this project. Uh, and uh, one of them was Andrew uh, Bundes. Uh, and the second one is uh, Katherine Hermanson, so I'll hand it over to her. Hi, everyone. Okay, so I'm the student. Um, so I'm a senior at Michigan State University, which we're here, so that kind of makes sense. Um, I study media and information, and my focus is on animation and comics. So I study everything from 3D model building, animation, 2D animation, motion graphics, graphic design kind of the more artistic communication side. So I got brought in on this project. My professor knew Shannon, and Shannon knew JD, and there was just some communication that happened, and I got brought on board. And so basically my job is to take all of the interesting, wonderful things of the EFRIB and try to translate that. Um, I'm coming from 
a background of being kind of ignorant to what's going on in there because I don't I'm not a STEM person so I don't know a lot of the science that happens there so that's kind of part of my job is to translate that um, translate the machines translate the science the careers that happen in there into something that somebody like myself would be able to understand and to enjoy so that's what I'm doing on this project Oh, okay, so the toy. <laughs> so this is our 360 camera that we've been using, and it's an Insta. And so it has six lenses, and it's used to create 3D um, 360 images. And so we've been placing them throughout the facilities to be able to project it onto the Digistar systems. Um, it's been really successful so far, so I'm excited to see where we can go from here. And yeah, it's very exciting. Yeah, so that's me. And we'll hand it over to Zach. Cool. Thank you. How many microphones do you have? All right, does that live? Yeah, it's live. Hi, guys. Hi. It's my turn now. Okay, so uh, like I said, I'm Zach. I am the outreach coordinator for the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory across the street. Uh, so you are at the planetarium, and this is where I work. And it is, in fact, one of the top three rare isotope facilities in the entire world. Yeah, I know. You should be impressed by that. Uh, the other two best laboratories in the world are in Germany and Japan, so we're best on this side of the world. Take that, Canada. Yeah. <laughs> and I should check. Can we have Canadians in the house? Yeah, Canadians. Woo! Okay, look. <laughs> I will say right up front, Canada is awesome, okay? It's just when it comes to nuclear science, we win. So uh, we're really, really good at this. We're, it's a friendly rivalry. So uh, my job, <laughs> they, oh, nice. Uh, my job, 100% of the time, is explaining what we do in that laboratory. It is a large National Science Foundation funded facility. Uh, and of course, one of the great things about the National Science Foundation, if they're gonna give you a lot of money to do this kind of research, they require that you explain it to people. So that is my job, 100% of the time. I give tours, I give talks about the lab, uh, we have, of course, the open house, uh, I presented the science festival, it's great, you guys should come back in April for the science festival. But also, um, well, there's just lots of ways that we can talk about this, and uh, I love giving tours, but there are lots of audiences that just can't take a tour. Either they're too big, you guys are too big, okay? Also, uh, you know, it's a walking tour, like you said, there's just a lot of things. So having the virtual tour exist is a wonderful outlet for me and our laboratory because we love explaining this to people and sometimes this is the best way. Uh, and like J.D. said, on this virtual tour, you get to see things you don't normally get to see on the actual tour because, uh, promise me, you can't go there. I mean, maybe if you get level two radiation safety training. Yeah, everybody sits on the board. Okay, so uh, we're gonna take you in that building. I'm gonna give you the, uh, the old virtual tour. You know, Catherine's working on the new virtual tour. You're going to have to come back now and see it. That's what, oh, speaking of the science festival, that's when it'll be. So April, come back. It's going to be great, guys. Uh, so we enter, of course, on a lovely map of Michigan State University, uh, and it's old. It's an old map. We need a better map. Uh, for instance, there's a parking lot here that does not exist anymore. Look, my car. Uh, this is actually where the new accelerator has been built, and uh, I'm going to tell you more about that. So let me take you into that building. We're going to start in our atrium, uh, which is a really fancy way of saying it's our lunchroom. Here you go. This is where we eat lunch. Those are real plants, guys. <laughs> I know, right? Okay. So it's a wonderful place. Uh, and I like showing it off. And I like, you know. So again, we took these 3D, uh, 3, 360, now you got me saying it, 360 degree pictures, photospheres, right? So it's like sitting in the middle of the atrium. And oops, go back, sorry. Sorry, I messed up, wrong button. So uh, one of my favorite features of this particular uh, show is I can do this, and that's really just dis disorienting, especially if you're standing up, I'd like to point out. So just look around a little bit. The um, thing is, uh, this atrium, uh, of course, you see the glass ceiling there. Uh, our laboratory is added on so many times, eventually this little courtyard got kind of walled in, and so they put a ceiling on it and call it the atrium, and now we eat lunch there. Uh, but what we're really in here for is because this wall is very pretty. 
uh, this wall right here. There you go. That is a piece of art and it's on a big concrete wall. And behind that concrete wall is a cyclotron. Because that's just where this we eat next to it. It's fine. Okay, so trust me, I've worked there 12 years and I'm perfectly normal. So let's move on to the next step. Yeah, it depends on your definition. But uh, so again, we've gone through that wall, we've gone through some more walls, and now we are looking at the K500 superconducting cyclotron. So again, my job is literally explaining it, so let's get into it. Uh, what we do at our laboratory is pretty simple. What we want to do is smash nuclei really hard. If you want to do good physics, it's generally breaking stuff. And we're very, very good at it. And this is our machine. This is 10 feet wide, five stories tall. You just can't see the whole thing at once. A and uh, basically, nuclei come up in the middle of it. They go around in a circle. It's a cyclotron, you know. It goes around in a circle, and it goes faster, 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 faster. You see this red stripe? That's actually the plane in which the nuclei travel. We are accelerating them, right? It's a particle accelerator. Eventually, they get out to the edge of this thing, and they come shooting out, and we're going to smash them really hard. So uh, that's why we had this cyclotron. We built that in 1982, world's first superconducting cyclotron. We uh, finished it in 82. In 88, we finished a bigger one. You're always building bigger ones. Otherwise, you're not catching up, guys. So uh, nuclei come into this cyclotron. They go fast. They come out here. At this point, they're going 30,000 mile, uh, yeah, 30, miles per second, which, of course, is not fast enough. So go into the bigger one, and when they come out of here, they're traveling half the speed of light. That's equivalent to four times around the Earth per second. That's faster than Superman. Look it up. So in the target, we smash in the target. Uh, the target's a little chunk of beryllium. And if your nucleus hits a, a nu nucleus in the beryllium, it breaks. And we have, of course, I mean, this is great. You can show pictures of the laboratory. You can show, of course, this 3D model. This is, I mean, actually the kind of model that we used in designing and building the machines. And now we're going to get a little uh, simulation, essentially. Now we are in the cyclotron, obviously. And uh, <laughs> you've got these, uh, these fan blade looking things are the actual accelerating parts. We call them Ds. Here's a nucleus. All nuclei are green and white, as you know. And um, nucle this nucleus is going to go in a circle. It goes, it goes in a circle because the magnetic field is extremely strong, and that kind of just makes charged particles go in a circle. It goes faster because these fan blade looking things charge up to 140,000 volts. So really high voltage is how you're going to make the nucleus go faster. So you can see it is accelerating, and it's going to make us very dizzy. Uh, so eventually it does actually... Uh, travel to the outside. It's going fast enough that it gets all the way to the edge, and now it's going to escape the cyclotron going down a pipe, which it does not show you a pipe. But there it goes, off in the distance. It is traveling, uh, and it is now going to fragment, is what we call it. Um, you know, it's smashing, is, of course, what we're really doing. So we have a target, like I said, is beryllium. Uh, here's a nucleus of beryllium. Uh, I'm sure there's other nuclei of beryllium around. It's just they're very far away. And here comes the nucleus we accelerated. It's something stable, oxygen-18, right? You're breathing it. It's great. And here's beryllium-9, and your oxygen-18 is coming in at half the speed of light. We slowed it down for you, so you'll see it. Yeah, <laughs> we're helping you guys out. It's great. So the nucleus comes in. Uh, of course, you couldn't see this either, right? We're making it easy. So the nucleus comes in at half the speed of light. And literally, if it you know, physically bumps into the thing, it shatters. A whole lot of fragments fly off in different directions. And what you have now is something else, right? You had stable oxygen. You had stable beryllium. Now you have lithium-11. This is pretty short-lived. This is radioactive. exists for less than a second. Boron-8, less than a second. Uh, helium-4, stable, boring. Uh, we got some other... But like this is literally our job. We take the stable common nuclei, of which we have plenty, right? You guys are chock full of them. And we break them and make something interesting something short-lived. So this is a chunk of three protons, eight neutrons, lithium-11. And lithium-11 is a very interesting nucleus. Uh, it's short-lived, so it's difficult to study, but it is the kind of thing we want to learn about in our laboratory. Uh, of course, like I say, it's radioactive. It will decay. Beta decay. There you go. So anyway, a particle comes out. It's going to end up being something else. So 
Uh, this is what we literally do. There are lots of nuclei, uh, lots of kinds. You guys are made of pretty much stable ones, but you know that unstable ones do exist. Carbon-14, you probably heard of, you know, uranium, uh, all that kind of stuff. There are many, many, many rare radioactive isotopes, is what we call them, and our laboratory wants to study them. The only way we're going to get them is by making them ourselves. So here's the thing. When we smash nuclei, we make lots of different fragments. And the problem is uh, you don't want them all. You only want the specific kinds of nuclei that you want. I mean, that seems clear. So researchers come into our lab looking for something specific, maybe lithium-11, maybe. Well, we smash the nuclei way back over there in the corner, in the target. And coming out of that target is a lot of junk, frankly. Because you smash a billion nuclei per second, and of those billion per second, you might get one that you actually want. Because you don't control what you're going to make. So how are you going to get just the lithium-11 out of all the stuff? Well, this is the filter. If you've ever heard of a mass spectrometer, that's what chemists use to separate different elements. This is our mass spectrometer, 35 meters long, and it's going to select one nucleus out of a million billion others with magnets. Everything's magnets, guys. That's how you solve problems. Uh, so what we have here, this big gray one, is a dipole magnet. Uh, you can think of it kind of like a prism. If you send white light into a prism, it separates the colors. This magnet separates different isotopes, different kinds of nuclei. So according to their charge and mass, you can pick out the nuclei you want. So this is the separator. Uh, if this is kind of like a prism, this one's kind of like a lens. This is a whole bunch of magnets, quadrupole magnets, that focus the beam of nuclei as they go through. So you want to keep them going in the right direction, separate out the ones you don't want, keep the ones you're, that you kept still going in the right direction, et cetera, et cetera. Of course. And yes, it's green. It has a big white S on it. That's just how we do. It's pretty obvious. So you smash a whole lot of nuclei. You make a few that you want. You filter out all the garbage nuclei with this thing. And now you've got a beam of very few nuclei that are interesting to you. And now you're going to measure them. Now, of course, <laughs> uh, this is the hard part. Well, it's all hard parts, frankly. But in the end, you're trying to study something you can't see. So how do you do that? Well, nuclei come in here in this pipe. You always travel in pipes. Uh, if nuclei go through the air, they hit air and stop. So there's no air in here. But a, it's a vacuum of pretty much outer space. It's pretty much the same pressure as outer space coming through here. Uh, nuclei hit a target here, actually. And then fragments fly, in fact, through the air uh, as neutrons fly through the air. Neutrons are not stopped. And they hit these black bars over here. Uh, these black bars, uh, there's 288 of them. On the inside of these black bars, they are a clear plastic. When neutrons or other radiation hits that clear plastic, it glows purple. It's very pretty. I've seen it. So how do you observe these particles? You can't look at them directly, right? The most powerful microscopes on Earth barely see an atom, and the nucleus is 10,000 times smaller. You're never going to see these particles, but you can see purple light. That's not so hard. The purple light comes down here to the end. These are photomultiplier tubes. They amplify light. They send a signal through, oh, 12 miles of wire we got here. 12 miles of wire. <laughs> this is a really great spaghetti. I mean, you think you got spaghetti problems, OK? We got it, seriously. Uh, and then we bring the signals into the computer here, and the computer says, aha, I saw some light from this bar, so I can tell you where that particle is. I can tell you how fast it's going, what direction it's going, all that stuff. So uh, there's actually two sets of black bars here. The, bu the back set here is MONA, Modular Neutron Array. This is LISA. Yeah, they worked hard on that, guys. A large multi-institutional scintillator array. I'm not kidding. OK, it's really important. You guys, yeah, why not? They smile. It's just a very enigmatic smile. OK, so uh, important to have good ac acronyms. You guys all know this. It's very important. So uh, Mona Lisa, what's great about Mona Lisa, aside from the name, is a collaboration of over a dozen schools, faculty of those schools designed in, uh, this particular detector. Undergrads built the whole thing. Undergrads brought it here, put it together. Undergrads do their own experiments. Right? This is a $2 million student project. Right? That's my favorite thing about it. And one of the most important things that we could do in a, you know, a world-class rare isotope laboratory in the middle of a university 
is teach the next generation of nuclear scientists what better way than getting your hands dirty on this thing. So there you go. It's great. So it's a wonderful, wonderful detector. It's one of our many detectors. Um, and I've got a model of it as well. You know, it's just a whole bunch of bars, you know. Uh, but uh, Mona Lisa is great, and uh, it's a wonderful detector. It has actually been removed from that room. We really do need to update this particular uh, tour because that room is now empty. We're in the process of moving something else into it. We've moved Mona Lisa somewhere else. Uh, but Mona Lisa will continue to be a very important part of our work because, like I said, training the next generation is a big deal. So uh, that's how we measure things we can't see, and we're quite good at it. Otherwise, people wouldn't want to come to our lab. Now, what are we trying to do? Of course, I already mentioned, right? Studying the nucleus. Look, it's stuff, right? Just like you, made of atoms, center part of the nucleus. Uh, this is an important point to make right here. We draw this picture a lot, right? It's called the Bohr model of the atom. Is it accurate? Not even close, okay? This is what we like to show people because it's the easy thing to look at and everybody recognizes it and that's great. Guys, if this was to scale, you would not be able to see the nucleus because it's so small, right? But in the process of studying these ridiculously tiny nuclei, we are trying to understand how matter as a whole works. Now, uh, I do a lot of, you know, outreach, talking to different audiences about what we you know, do in the laboratory, and it's awesome, right? We're smashing nuclei and stuff like that. Uh, guess whose money we're spending? It's y'all, right? Yeah, it's you. Thanks, guys. So something that often comes up when I'm talking to people about this is, who cares? <laughs> yeah, and that is a legit question. Who cares? Guys, we're studying nuclei. Not only are we studying something you can't see, we're studying nuclei that don't exist on Earth because they're so radioactive. So what good is that going to do you? Well, that's, everything's made of them, including humans. And the things that we use to study the nucleus, the detectors that we invent to measure the nuclei, you now call MRI, CAT scan, PET scan, x-rays. We invented ways to study the nucleus, and now they're using those same ways to look inside your body without cutting you open. You're welcome, okay? <laughs> yeah, it worked out. It worked out, guys, yeah. I love it. You guys are giving me way too much credit. I appreciate it. Okay, I just like taking credit for things. So, uh, MRIs, right? So, uh, doctors are you know, figuring out what's going on in your body. They're, they actually uh, can, in fact, uh, treat cancer. They're killing tumors with particle accelerators. They're just training high-energy particles on the tumor cells and killing them off outright. We are curing cancer with nuclear science. That's pretty good. What else can we do? Well, uh, you probably know about, you know, we can make electricity. 20% of the electricity in this country is made with nuclear power, You're just breaking nuclei. Uh, and different countries in the world have sometimes more energy tank made that way. So that's really important. Uh, there's a ton of applications, right? So who cares? It's valuable to study the nucleus. The things we learn become useful. And this is why we keep doing it. And that's why we keep building new things. You are now standing in a building, not really, you're sitting in a building, uh, that is, that I can't take you on the actual tour. Nobody ever gets to go here. Uh, it is a, uh, it is between our building and the Wharton Center, if you've ever been there. So, right, your Broadway shows are on one side, nuclear science is on the other side. And uh, in this building, we have a clean room. That's what we're looking at right here. This is a clean room. Let me rotate this slightly. Uh, in that clean room, my apologies. Probably don't really need to do it again. Definitely look down is <laughs> a problem. Uh, okay, so in this room, uh, you can see there's a few metal cylinders kind of sitting on a cart back here. Those metal cylinders are next generation particle accelerators, right? If you're trying to do cutting edge, world leading research, you have to be improving your laboratory all the time. That seems pretty clear. Uh, well, our lab has been around since 1964. The only reason we're still around is because we are always improving the laboratory. Well, we're building something better, you know, all the time. I told you we're top three in the world. Is top three good enough? No, thank you for saying that. Uh, you got to be number one. You got you to keep improving. So we are currently in this building in the middle of what used to be Bogue Street, uh, building these cylinders. 
These cylinders are a linear accelerator, basically. There's a kind of a pipe that goes through them all. And nuclei come in one side, and the cylinder charges to a million volts. Never touch. Right? Nucleus comes shooting out the other side. The next one charges to a million volts, comes shooting out faster, et cetera, et cetera. You put a bunch of these cylinders in a row, you have a linear accelerator. And we are currently building that accelerator in the tunnel. So we have two cyclotrons right now, and they are on the ground level. Right? You, you walk into the building, you don't have to go up and down any stairs to get to the cyclotrons. They're on the first floor. It's actually not that hard. But most accelerators are, in fact, buried because um, they produce radiation, and dirt blocks radiation for free. So you are now in a tunnel. The floor of this tunnel is 35 feet underground. Up that shaft is where the beam will start. So we're basically, we've installed uh, a source of nuclei, which we got, uh, this picture is pretty old. We need to upgrade it as well. Um, they're going to come down this shaft in a pipe. And then those cylinders you saw will be in boxes. And these boxes will go off in the distance. Whole lot of nuclei. So nuclei go this way. And then they'll turn. And they'll come back this way. They'll go around behind you and off again. So basically, it's a long linear accelerator folded twice. It looks like a paper clip more than anything. OK? Just keep that in your mind. So this right now, you know, not much going on in here. But there is more now that we've built it. And if you ever get a chance to go down that tunnel during an open house or something, highly recommended. Number one, it's the most beautiful tunnel. But also, it's a wonderful, wonderful accelerator. So uh, we're building it. We're, uh, we're partway done. I don't know. Still got a ways to go. But parts of the accelerator are in here. And this new accelerator, uh, I can show you kind of what it looks like because we have a small version that's really a, a large file. So it takes a long time to get up. OK? This is a really, really big file. There you go. So. We have built a small version of this accelerator we call RIA-3, the re-accelerator. Basically, nuclei come in here at almost zero speed. And when they come out, they're going about 8% of the speed of light. Now, the cyclotrons get up to half the speed of light, which obviously sounds more impressive. 8% is what you'd see in a star. So here's where we get to the real planetarium stuff, guys. A big chunk of what we do in our laboratory is called nuclear astrophysics, which is just a fancy way of saying, how do stars work? It's pretty much nuclear reactions, right? That's basically what's going on, which drives the star, right? So our laboratory, in fact, is one of the best places in the world to do nuclear astrophysics. And not only can we make the kinds of rare radioactive nuclei that you would find in an actual star, we can make them go the same speed that they would in a star. Now we can reproduce the actual reactions that you would find in a star environment, right? So we're trying to understand what drives stars, why do they die, uh, what happens when neutron stars merge. That's always very exciting, right? It's kind of a big deal now. So uh, these are the kinds of things we do, and we can reproduce it in the laboratory. So in building this small accelerator, uh, we built 15 of those metal cylinders in a row, and it goes not that fast. But FRIB, I haven't even said the name yet. FRIB, let's go back for a second. Down in this tunnel, we're building the FRIB accelerator. F, facility, R, rare, I, isotope, B, beams. FRIB, it looks like FRIB. I promise you it's FRIB. And uh, it is the facility for rare isotope beams. And this new accelerator, when that is in place, the facility for rare isotope beams will be able to do nuclear astrophysics and other things better than we ever have before, right? That's kind of the deal, actually. So uh, building this was kind of a proof of concept. Nobody's ever built an accelerator like this before. We did. It works. Now we're building a much bigger one. So uh, what are we going to be able to do? Uh, well, we're going to be able to study the stars, like I said. Bring them down to Earth. So look, Orion, right? You got Orion's Nebula just below the belt. And Orion's Nebula is, of course, a stellar nursery. So understanding protostars, how stars begin their progress towards the main sequence, that will be an important part of what we want to learn at our laboratory. 
Uh, we want to understand the main sequence fusion that goes on in the star. And of course, the steps towards the end of the star's life, right? So at the core, we've got a lot of really hot gas. It's performing fusion. We can reproduce fusion reactions in our laboratory to try and understand how that works, why it fails in some cases, that kind of stuff. Stars evolve. And, you know, I mean, we, can, we can't watch them evolve in real time, but we can, based on the nuclear theory, the nuclear experiment, and the observations that, uh, you know, astronomers make, we can try to understand how this process goes, right? Towards the end of the sun's life, it'll become a red giant, right? And, of course, this is the point when you don't want to be on Earth anymore because it gets swallowed up. That's something to look forward to. So it's going to swell way, way up, and, uh, you know, at the end of its life, uh, at this point, it's fusing, you know, helium into carbon. That's pretty much as far as it's going to go. And there's still some hydrogen to helium fusion going on there, too. And, of course, at its last stage, it throws off a massive amount of gas, becomes a white dwarf, and is surrounded by a planetary nebula. Understanding this process is literally one of the most important things our laboratory can do. And with EFRIB, with the new accelerator, we will be able to produce nuclei that no one else on Earth has access to. But we're pretty sure those nuclei are critical to this process, the process of a star's death, right? So, I mean, obviously, you know, white dwarfs, but also supernova, neutron star mergers, that kind of stuff. We're going to be able to produce things that no one else has, and we're going to learn things nobody else knows. We're going to be number one. That's the goal, right? The top, top three is no good. So we are now back in East Lansing. Uh, you've been here the whole time. But, right, that's what's going on across the street in that building. Uh, it is quite amazing. Let me tell you, 50,000 students, how many of them have any idea what's going on there? Almost nobody, right? You guys know more than almost everybody here. So, yeah, feel good about yourselves, number one, but tell your friends, because almost nobody knows. I used to be one of those students walking by this thing, and I had no idea what was going on there. I had friends who worked there. They didn't tell me. <laughs> so... Tell your friends, is what I'm trying to say. Now, because I want you to know a lot of things, I'm going to do a couple things. Number one, I brought free paper. Yes, because I care about you. I got free paper. I got a postcard. It has a website on it. So if you want to learn more, you go to the website. I also brought my business card because you can call me. It's fine. I mean, my job is literally to do outreach. So if you or somebody you know wants to know about this, that's my job. And I'm more than happy to explain it to you. Um, also, uh, I'm going to stick around at lunch, so if you want to, you know, talk my ear off, actually, I'll probably do a lot of talking, but, uh, you know, find me, and I'm happy to talk to you, and, and uh, J. Deep and Catherine are going to join us as well, so we're happy to talk about this project. We're super excited about it because it's a great opportunity to teach people, you know, with Planetarium about nuclear science. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. I can take questions until they make me stop. Yes. Uh, thanks for taking us on this journey. I'm going to try to <sighs> the journey. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, in chronological order, uh, first thing, Catherine, you mentioned in the beginning you're not a STEM professional. Mm -hmm. You're at a career expo, and you're familiar with STEAM? Ah, are you for, uh, STEAM, STEAM is putting great. art back in the career expo. They're yeah. saying if we're hiring someone, we're really wanting STEAM more than STEM. So it's great that you guys are doing arts this, and putting math. arts in the, in the STEM. Yeah. Um, second uh, question, I guess, um, is your logo. Uh, I don't know. Now that I, I saw your presentation, I kind of understand it. But the summer I, I was at uh, Newgrange, it's a, a UNESCO site in Ireland, and, and they have a passage tomb. Uh, and the symbol that you have for your logo is really, really close really to nice. these ancient stone carvings <laughs> that nobody understands. And as soon as I saw your logo, I thought, wow, I wonder if that's intentional. And then after seeing your blueprint designs, clearly it's not. But you've somehow come to the same uh, logo as ancient stone sure, carvers sure. And, and ancient. So and I'm, the, I'm not going to say that there isn't some mysterious connection. <laughs> I'm not going to say that. Time travel, time yeah. travel. There you go. Uh, and the last question is, you have a million volts in your new uh, three-cylinder. Yeah. Okay, I'm thinking about dielectric breakdown. Oh, I know. Okay, like, how do you achieve how a million you, volts yes. across a small gap yes. without getting sparking? Yes. It's hard. 
Uh, but that's share. why. Like, so we have, okay, we have 800 some people. This is something I didn't mention already. We have 800 some people working at our laboratory. Uh, and we have a ton of accelerator physicists whose job it is to invent these things. So, of course, that is a real trick, you know, applying that high of a voltage, a st ridiculously strong field. Of course, those cavities have to be very precisely formed and extraordinarily clean because any dirt on that surface is going to cause sparking. Um, but they do it. I mean, they, it, it is hard making it that, but they have spent, I mean, what we are building now is the result of decades of design and development. Um, so we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, yeah, come to the come to the open house sometime. They might be able to show you an actual cavity. My question isn't a hundred percent serious, but it's pretty serious. <laughs> Obviously, you guys do rare element research or rare earth type research, mm -hmm. uh, particularly. But is there any effort to discover a new element so you can <gasps> name it Michiganium? Is there? That yeah! Ah! Yeah. Ah! I knew it. Okay, you know, here's the thing. I just went to this talk. It was a couple. Did you see that talk? It was really good. I just went to this talk uh, uh, by this guy out of Berkeley who's doing, uh, you know, new. They're, they're always working on new elements. Of course, a lot of the new elements nowadays are being discovered in Dubna, Russia. They got a facility there that's really good. Uh, and the trick with discovering new elements, heavier elements, is you got to take really heavy things and somehow manage to get them to jam together, right? Doing fusion on heavy elements is extraordinarily difficult. Now, our research is generally breaking heavy stuff down into something lighter. So, in general, we're not aiming for that. However, <laughs> that's not to say that with the EFRIB accelerator, we couldn't do exactly that. Uh, although, the, if we were going to discover something new, and we're, everybody's excited about like element 122, maybe, could be close to stable or something crazy. Uh, if we do end up doing that, and do an, I, I'm aiming for Spartium. That's what I'm going to vote for. <laughs> Spartium! In Michigan it would be nice, obviously. Uh, someday, someday. Yeah, I know. It would be, it would be clearly, uh, it would be nicer in Michigan, I suppose. So yeah, that's the problem. You don't get to name isotopes. Um, I grew up outside SLAC, and I'm just curious how your facility compares to what Slack's doing, if you guys work together, and the facilities that you mentioned in Germany, where they are, mm -hmm. and what you are doing with them, potentially, sure. if you're allowed to talk about it. Sure. And I hope sure. you are. Uh, they don't tell me anything that we shouldn't tell people. Because uh, I just tell everything. Uh, so, Slack, Stanford Linear Accelerator. Basically, the linear accelerator goes through a mountain. Uh, that's pretty sweet, right off the bat. Um, Slack. Like a lot of other laboratories, uh, it has a big accelerator. They're doing pretty much electrons that I know of. They're accelerating electrons. We accelerate heavy ions, so there's a little bit of a difference there. Um, There's so many different accelerators around the world, and they have different goals, essentially. Uh, one of the biggest uh, electron accelerators I know about uh, is at Jefferson Laboratory in Virginia. And they are also doing nuclear research, but they're studying stable nuclei, and they're just shooting electrons in there and trying to understand the structure. Uh, and we study rare radioactive ones. And then, of course, uh, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN in Switzerland, right? That one's, what, 17 miles around? I got to do this. Like this. OK, so that accelerator, they're trying to break down to the, you know, they're trying to understand the most fundamental, smallest pieces of matter, quarks, gluons, that kind of stuff. So there's lots of accelerators, and they're doing different niches of physics, generally. So there's physics, there's nuclear, there's rare isotope, and we own that. That's like, so we, you know, so Slack does something different, JLab, everybody, they're all doing something different, and like, we found our niche, and we're trying to be number one in that. Now the other two labs I mentioned, uh, GSI in Darmstadt, Germany, and Riken in Waco, Japan, are two of the other best rare isotope laboratories in the world. And, um, you know, we compete nominally, but we're really, I mean, we're all nuclear scientists, so a lot of our researchers go there for their experiments, and a lot of theirs come to us, because it depends on who's doing the best work in that particular niche that they're working on. Uh, like I said, we're really big into nuclear astro, so uh, if people want to do that, they're probably going to want to come here. Um, and then, of course, the goal is, once that is done, why would you go anywhere else? That's the goal. So, it, it varies. All right, so I have to ask you to forgive my uh, ignorance. of how I haven't had a particle physics class yet. But, uh, uh, fine. <laughs> so, uh, why do you choose uh, beryllium as the base to oh. smash stuff into? Yes, okay. So, I actually know this one. Uh, well, you know, I mean, we have 800-some people working at the lab. 
You know, sometimes I'll be taking a tour and people will be like, what's that thing? I have no idea what that thing is. Okay, so beryllium is actually a really good element for this. Uh, if you're trying to send a beam of possibly charged nuclei through a target, uh, basically the more electrons that these nuclei see, the more the beam will tend to spread because they're interacting electrically with the electrons and you got positive and negative charges. So you, don't, you wanna have the lowest electron density you can get. Beryllium is element four. It's only four electrons. For, so that's pretty good. I mean, hydrogen would be even lower, but uh, beryllium is solid, which is great. Uh, and so beryllium, another nice side effect of beryllium is that it has a really high melting point. So you have this solid chunk, you heat it with a beam, it doesn't melt. Yet. <laughs> now we're doing this today with a billion nuclei per second. The advantage of FRIB, the new accelerator, it'll be smashing hundreds of billions per second, and it would totally destroy the beryllium target. So we've worked out other op op options. Uh, we've got a carbon target that spins. Uh, I think it's cool with liquid lithium. Oh boy, that sounds safe. So, you know, just don't be hanging out next to that. That's, that's the thing. Okay, back corner. Um, so you said you're working on, uh, like, stellar um, evolution and, like, the, the yeah, star yeah. stuff. Um, are you also kind of working on um, uh, fusion generators, um, stuff like that as well? Okay. Yes, okay. Um, this is what everybody wants to know, because, like, we need fusion power now. It would be great, guys. So here's the thing. We, we need... We do such pure research, basic, for the sake of knowing that kind of stuff. Uh, it is very difficult to point to the research that we do and say, oh, and that's going to help us with this. Uh, you know, obviously, you know, in the detectors we invent today, probably will be used in medicine somewhere down the road. Uh, you know, and the new isotopes that we discover, who knows, they might be used somewhere, maybe. Uh, with fusion, of course, we do actual fusion uh, studies and, we're, and, and one of the things we actually do is try to understand uh, why fusion succeeds in some cases and, and fails. They call it pseudo-fission, when two nuclei almost fuse, but then come back apart. And so we're literally trying to understand why fusion fails in some cases. Uh, so that's probably the, the one thing that I can point to and say, you know what? When we have a fusion reactor for power down the road, that research is going to be important. So. Uh, the things we learn, for the sake of knowing now, because we're not actually specifically trying to make a fusion reactor, but it's going to be important. It will be useful. So I was also curious about the beryllium target. Uh, foil? Is it a rod? Is it a wire? Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a small chunk. Uh, the, the thing is, here's the trick. Um, your, your chances of hitting one nucleus on another one is really small because they are very small. So um, what I usually do is I imagine, say, imagine that the nucleus was a golf ball. The entire atom is Spartan Stadium. Put that golf ball on the 50 yard line. You wanna hit that golf ball, take another golf ball outside the stadium, chuck it over the side. Good luck, guys. That's why we throw a billion golf balls in there every second. Something's gonna hit something, right? So we depend on statistics. Now, if you want to be sure to hit a beryllium you know, nucleus in that target, you just make that target really thick. You're, you're going to hit some eventually, right? Come on. Well, the problem is, the thicker the target is, the more interaction you're going to have with those electrons, so your beam is going to spread. So you have to find a, me a medium ground. So it's not quite a foil, it's not quite a big chunk, but it's a little chunk. Exactly how big, I couldn't say. Good question. Yes. I was wondering what that four pi thing you over had you had over in BPS was. Yeah. Oh, you guys saw it. Yeah. Okay. There's a metal soccer ball over in BPS. Boy, you can't miss it. Uh, it's called the four pi because it is does cover a four pi solid angle, right? So that is a detector that we used from 1988 to 2008. In fact, it was a friend of mine who did the last experiment on it. Uh, Micah in Notre Dame. You know. Hi, Keith. I'm so glad you're here because you've given me like a like a ton of shows. I'm finally getting to return the favor. There you go. I'm, I'm that guy. You are that guy too. Okay. Anyway, just, we have a connection. Notre Dame is great. I just want to point that out. Okay. Yeah, they're pretty cool. So um, the four pi detector is a detector. You know, they took out the the target. There was a thin foil in the middle. So basically, a beam of nuclear would come into the center of the sphere. It would hit that target, and then particles would come out. 
the beauty of the four pi, of course, is that it didn't matter what direction the particles or the light or whatever you got coming out, it could go in any direction and you had these telescope things from all directions. Of course, now most of them have been removed um, because they want you to be able to see it. Also, those are valuable <laughs> and they reused them. But they left a few of them in there so you could see what it used to be like. Um, and so it's, it's a detector for uh, you know, measuring the reaction products coming out of this center point. That's what it is. And now it's art. Because we're physicists and we can do anything. It's art. Yes? I'm wondering about funding. Where, how where does your funding come from? So, and yeah. how, how are the individuals that you hire um, funded? Do they, are they all working on grants? Or is there some basic um, budget that, that is going to be uh, applied by the administrators uh, as, they, as they want to? Mm -hmm. Money. Let's talk about it. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, an operating grant from the National Science Foundation, so it's tax money. Um, and that is $23 million this year, I believe. $23 million. Uh, it's usually on a five-year basis. So they say, okay, we're going to give you this grant for the next five years, and at the end of five years, we'll review you, and if you're, we're still happy, then we'll renew that grant. So that's for operating. That's for running the laboratory. Now, the faculty, probably not on that grant. They are, often get their own grants. So uh, J.D. wanted to do this great new project, so he applied for an NSF career award, and he got it, because that's how good he is. And but of course, that's how good our, our faculty are. <laughs> so uh, yeah, they're mostly grant funded. There's a few faculty salaries that are supplied by MSU, uh, but our operations are entirely in NSF, and then uh, the various other projects that are around the laboratory. NSF, Department of Energy, uh, even, you know, um, so the National Nuclear Security Administration, all kinds of things, because there's a lot of different projects that we can do. Good question. Shoot. So I see that there's that uh, Insta360 camera up there on the, the look at this thing. on the stage. That's a very expensive camera. Uh, I guess, is that going to be given away as one of the door prizes? <laughs> it is sitting up here, isn't it? It is on the door no. prize table. <laughs> we kind of need it for this project. I, I Did you say what the resolution was of that camera? Yeah, what is the resolution is it 8K? of that camera? It is an 8K camera. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's great. Yeah, it's just one. I'm, I'm, I, I think you guys already talked about it before I came in, but it's just, do, do you want to talk about it? Or have you already talked about it? Anyone have any questions about the camera? Why don't you stand up and... Uh, cost. Oh, expensive. Uh, cost. Uh, this guy paid for it. 6K. 6K. 6K for an 8K. Yeah. So how it works, basically you can see that there's six cameras on all of the sides, because it's a circle. Um, and basically we have a tripod and we just kind of set it down like that. And then, um, so it's a wireless connection, so I actually have an app on my phone where I can get it to take the picture and we all run away so we're not in the picture. And yeah, it's very cool, it's very cool. And so you can record video and like and JPEG footage on it as well. So. When we do the new version, you should play a Where's Waldo of us and see if you can find us hiding in the picture. There's definitely yeah, pictures yeah. of us where we were taking them originally, and all of us just kind of stood in a corner and pretended to look at computers and things like that. Which is very funny. So, yeah, that's it. looks like there was a saw at the top that was not. Yeah, those were taken old before. We had this camera, and I think those might have even just been ones with the old cell phone or the station. No, so no, it was. Right. Yeah, the those system. were from the old. Do you want to talk about yeah, that? Yeah, I'll talk about she that. She knows where okay. those came from. Because I remember kind of fixing them because they weren't complete. Yeah, we have a GIS uh, group on campus, and so they came out with their uh, SLR that's on like a special rotating tripod that took all the images, and they just never take the top ones. So they were either warped or had a weird circle. So this one is going to be more complete. Yeah, and, and those, those original ones are four years old. Yeah, yeah. So the ones you saw are not nearly as good as what you're going to see in the updated version. Come see it, OK? And we can edit them now, Catherine just said. So come back in April. Yeah, come back in April. That will be the, the premiere uh, of the new show. Yeah, ooh, we should do a dome cast. Can we do that? Who oh, would okay, want a dome cast? We did just start dome casting, so. I didn't know we could do that. Yeah, we can do that. I want to do that. We're going to do that now. Okay. Cool. Let's things get started. Uh, Woo! Like you get to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I can send you all the images, too. I'm a 
Can I do okay, it? So, all right, 1208. Jeez, I wish. Are, am I cutting into lunch? Okay. A- any other questions there? Oh, yes, there's one more. And then I have some announcements. And then it's food. I think this might actually be the most important question that anyone has asked. How do you mitigate the creation of monstrous plant life and superhumans? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So we have, I mean, we built this tunnel for all the students that, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, uh, so radiation, <laughs> okay. So what I love about our lab is yeah, people are always asking these, although usually it's more, yours was very creative, right? Because usually they're like, well, do you guys glow in the dark, ha <laughs> ha. No. Um, so, uh, right now, of course, we are making radioactive material 24 hours a day when we're running experiments, which is most of the time. Uh, the beauty of it is twofold. Number one, we make tiny amounts of radioactive material. I mean, we're smashing a billion nuclei per second, uh, which sounds like a lot, unless you remember Avogadro's number, which is huge. So, just forget it. Um, uh, and we really only have radioactive material while we're making it. So like, if there's an accident, oh no, the cyclotron has broken down. Well, I guess we're not making radioactive material anymore. So the beauty of it is, uh, we only have it while it's being made. Now to prevent that radiation from getting out, we are very concerned about that and we wanna keep ourselves safe and our, we, I take tours of there, you know, and people go through. So the equipment, is all surrounded, it's on the first floor, but it's surrounded by walls of concrete six feet thick. That blocks the radiation very effectively. The thing is, of course, we're building this effort accelerator, which is gonna be much higher energy and much more particles. So that's why we buried it. And it's just easier to block the radiation. Uh, Six feet of concrete wasn't gonna cut it, is the point. So that's why it's okay to take a tour. Come visit me sometime, You you can get my card. See, this is with the free giveaways. You want a piece of paper? Okay, I'm going to give it over to Shannon. Thank you very much. Thank you.